The results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss, and as you may incur as a result of information discussed in the meeting identified above. Okay, that was exciting. All right, anyway, so where are we? Um, <clears throat> So at the moment, we have an opportunity to short the S&P up here at 3,900. That's been a pretty good line. It's gone too far. Um, we can get a bigger view. Let's look at the futures charts before we jump into it. Uh, you know, here, well, no, nope, that's not the futures. Here we go. See, everybody's toppy toppy. Dow's like making new record high. Look at this, all the way up here. Uh, it's just crazy, huh? So the Dow's up 310, making the high. The s and is following. I mean, it's not, it's not, it doesn't look like the ideal time to short, but the 3900 line is a tough line. The Dow's a stupid index. You don't go by that. The NASDAQ obviously is still taking its hits. Uh, the Russell has come back and also making a play for the top. But you got resistance here on the Russell, clearly, right? Because if you go to zoom in a little bit, let's look at it, you know, 2300 is a good line of resistance on the Russell. Let's see if we can break it up here. So, right about here, it's going to be tough for it to get right over that. Then you got the NASDAQ is already having problems, right? And we expected the bounce. Remember, we talked about that yesterday that this is a bounce we expect off the 13,000 line. And that, that doesn't mean anything. If it doesn't go much further than that and it's already getting weak, we may have just a weak bounce and continue this play down to 12.5. Uh, the S and P, uh, as we said, we we don't. There's no reason the S and P shouldn't be doing what the Nasdaq is doing, and the Dow, of course, is its own thing. Just I'm not sure which stock it is that's doing it. But you can always find out. I mean, the Dow's up 300. It's like, well, what what's going on with the Dow? What components are making it do that? And if you go to Yahoo, this is not Yahoo. And if you go to Yahoo, that looks like it. And you put it in DJI. Then we can look at the components individually and see who's moving the Dow. So who's moving the Dow? The Dow is a point-oriented uh, system, so it matters who moved the most points. McDonald's, only half a, uh, half a percent, but one, one dollar. Two dollar move from Walt Disney. Three dollar move from Salesforce. We forgot they're even in the Dow. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a Dow company, does it? Uh, big drops here. Look at this. Amgen, Nike, Apple, and Walmart all heading the, the other way. But they're offset by IBM went up. JP Morgan went up. Johnson & Johnson went up nicely. Uh, oh, Johnson Johnson with the vaccine news. American Express went flying higher. 475 from Caterpillar. Remember we were talking about them the other day. Honeywell, 529. 824 from Goldman Sachs. You know, these are huge things. Boeing, 1466. They completely recovered from yesterday's drop and added 14 bucks. So that's why the Dow's up. The, you know, it's $8 per point. So figure um, uh, 40, 90, 100 points right, you know, almost 100 points right there just based on Boeing, 8.5, 8.5 points per dollar. So Boeing is good for 100 right there. Visa is good for close to that. Goldman's good for close to that. And then the rest of the entire Dow flat compared to those three gainers. So basically all of your gains came from, from Boeing. Let's see, Boeing plus Visa plus Goldman is 200 points. And then uh, Honeywell, Caterpillar, and these two guys would be another 100 points. There's your entire Dow gain. Everybody else, you know, they're, they're, they're zeros on there. They're a net zero. So, you know, a few outstanding companies can make the Dow do that. That's why you don't really pay attention to the Dow as far as, like, telling you what's going on with the indexes. It doesn't mean a lot. Um, and, of course, they do that purposely in the Dow to window dress things and so on and so forth. Now, Boeing's interesting. I mean, why do they have such a huge comeback? That's the question. So, B.A., uh, I mean, they just had an engine fall off one of their planes. So here's a Motley Fool. Here's why the computer thinks. These Motley Fool things are written by uh, computers. They're algorithms that, uh, that pull these news articles. 
and they pretend they're a story. Um, engine failures, two planes, uh, Wednesday external, they're Boeing and bounce right back. Okay. Uh, there were no casualties. Initial reports suggest that mechanical problems aboard a 787 uh, due to metal fatigue. Why would Boeing stop be going up during the seventh? Oh, well, it could be because Boeing learned a lot from practice and PR. In reporting this week, Boeing is winning praise from Rody for speedy response to the job. Wow, really? Okay, <laughs> it's like, well, you had it. Your engine fell off your plane, but at least you came. At least you came right out and talked about it. Which is, I mean, obviously it's good. It's no reason for the stock to actually go up. Um, Boeing issued a statement urging airlines to suspend the use of 777s with the Pratt and Whitney. So, and maybe there's not that many Pratt and Whitney engines on the Boeings. So maybe it's just a Pratt and Whitney problem that's got nothing to do with Boeing, and therefore you don't really penalize Boeing for the drop. That's that's the best possible explanation. This one does seem to be written by a human beings, so congratulations to this guy. Because <laughs> a lot of times you read Motley Fool, it's clearly written by the computers. All right. So what else is happening? Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. Um, oil. Oh, well, we know that. Oil's burning us. And we are trying to sell. Let's try to sell two more above 63, see if that works out during the time we're on. I'd like to short the S&P, but only below the 3,900 line. Then you want to use it as a stop. If it's over, it could go much over. We don't want to screw around with that. Look at the Dow. The Dow's completely broken over its resistance to the top. So, um, oh no, I'm sorry, it hasn't. There's another line there. It's had this thing in the way. So the Dow's, the Dow's up by, this is a resistance. This is R1, R2, S1, S2, support resistance. So the Dow's way up, it's still inside the zone. So it's not out of the question that the S&P can break out and go up into the zone also. Oh, I see, I have oil on both sides. So we have, what are we missing, the NASDAQ? See, the NASDAQ's weakening already too. So we'll see what happens, but it's been a rough week for the indexes. Then also you want to look at the few, you know, you want to look the VIX is pretty calm right now. So there's no panic sort of thing going on. Energy, we got oil, of course. Oh, really, really way up. We should look at that. We should look at this EIA report, see what that says. So let's see, date, 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 February 19th. What's today, the 24th? That sounds right, okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay. Oil refinery imports were down 2.6 million barrels a day. So in other words, the, the cold and everything and stuff in Texas caused inputs to the refineries to be 2.6 million barrels per day less. So, you know, it's very simple stuff to figure these things out. They want two calculators. All right, so 2.7 times uh, 2.6. 2.6 times 7 is 18.2. So we have a built-in 18.2 million barrel drawer of product because there's 2.6 million barrels a day less inputs. They have less supply. So the same demand would cause a draw of 18.2 million. But the problem with storms is they also impact demand because people can't go anywhere. The roads are closed. Uh, it's dangerous to travel. People stay home. People are home anyway. So this so is kind of a disaster. Uh, refineries operated 68 of their capacity. Gasoline production decreased to 7.7 .7 million barrels a day from what? I'm not sure. Gasoline, what did they say? 7.7 .7 million? I said 7.8 there, but oh, I see. No, that's production. Gasoline production decreased. Product supply. This is refinery activity. It's interesting that these are. It's interesting. It's such a huge discrepancy, right? This says 7.7. .7, that says 8.4. Distillate fuel production decreased to 3.6. And again, neither one of these things match up. That's pretty weird. Um, 
Crude imports averaged 4.6 million barrels a day last week. And oil, net imports, crude oil. <laughs> Where's that number? None of these numbers match. U.S. crude oil imports average This is so weird, right? None of these numbers match up. So, what, I mean, I, I don't know what to go by here. I don't think you can take any of this seriously. Uh, here's this all other oil category. There's a huge 11 million barrel draw in all other oils. Now, I guess that would be heating oil and stuff. So maybe that's why. It must be might be something to do with that. Um, Commercial crude oil inventories exceeded the SPR, increased by 1.3 million barrels from the previous week. I don't know. These these numbers do not match these numbers. That's unusual. And I'm not sure what to make of that, frankly. I mean, they're just way off. Everything's not what it says down here. So I don't know if you can draw any conclusions from this stuff. I mean, what we can see, though, is that we're still exporting 2.7 million barrels a day. Uh, we are importing 2.6. So there's really no point. <laughs> it's so funny. We're importing 2.6 and exporting 2.7. So we're net 104. We're, we're, we're actually net sending oil out of the country. So we, we have achieved energy independence, basically. We don't need anybody else's oil at all. The only reason we're importing oil is to turn it into product, and then we export the product right back out of the country. We don't actually need it, though. It's not necessary for the functioning of America's economy, um, <laughs> which, of course, is a completely artificially stimulated thing. So it's kind of weird. Now, Brendan's asking me, we can move a little away from oil anyway. Brendan's asking, I've read a lot about a silver squeeze due to which, oh, my oil filled speaking for oil. Uh, I read a lot of about uh, silver squeeze due to the shortage of physical. Do you have any thoughts on silver and it running up to 50 or higher? I, do I have any thoughts on, let, let's deconstruct what you're asking here. Do I have any thoughts on silver going to $50 like it did back here on a squeeze just because of speculation. Yeah, I mean, you think there's a shortage of physical silver, and there might be. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but can it happen? Yeah, it did happen. It happened in 2011. It hadn't happened 20 years before that, but it did happen in 2011. The last time that happened before that was when the hunts were trying to corner the market. I forgot when that was. So can it go up? Yeah, I can. I wouldn't bet on it, though. I'm not going to bet on – at any point here, you're betting on silver going, you know, ridiculously past. The fair value of silver is around here. It's 15, 16 bucks. That's the fair value for silver. You're, you're We're at 30 now. Somebody already got squeezed. Are we going to get squeezed all the way up to 50? I don't know. And, and it's not – I don't find that an interesting thing to bet on. It's just you're you're extrapolating and gambling. There's no uh, there's no fundamental underlying thing for it. I mean, there's a shortage of silver. Eh, not really. Silver is kind of plentiful. Uh, it's used in so much industrial stuff. Uh, it's just a question of uh, supply chain disruptions. That's what a lot of these commodity things are are supply chain disruptions because we have screwed up the entire global supply chain. And and one of the reasons it's also, by the way, one of the um one of the unintended consequences of all the stimulus is you're stimulating the economy and you know you're keeping uh people buying iPhones, let's say. For example, let's let's talk about it. people buying iPhones. Therefore, all the iPhone parts are in demand, including some including there's a lot of gold that goes into iPhones, uh, and other some other rare metals and such, and then there's chips, certain chips and so on and so forth. So uh, in a normal economy, in a normal recessionary economy where there's something wrong and we're slowing down, then 
nobody would be making chips and nobody would be making the 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 uh the the, the, the circuitry and so on and so forth for the phone but nobody would be buying the phones either so it would all work out it does reach a natural state of equilibrium when you artificially create the demand for iphones even though people are not working and producing the basic materials that go into the iphone and not producing the components that go into the iphone what happens you create a component you're artificially creating a component shortage right because normally the people who are making the iphone components would be laid off and they would not be going home and buying an iphone because they don't have the money but when you stimulate the economy when you throw 600 dollars a week at unemployed people and whatever and again i think that's i don't think it's a bad thing to do as far as helping society but it's a bad thing to do on a macro perspective you have to realize the damage you're causing because what you're doing is saying okay instead of not buying instead of getting laid off at the iphone component manufacturing plant and not buying an iphone and causing the balance between the supply and demand of iphones you are going to go home and buy an iphone because we're going to give you the money you need to buy the iphone therefore iphone demand stays high iphone part manufacturing is low and eventually what happens you run out of parts now you ran out of parts for iphone what does that do that causes inflation on two fronts this is why these stimulus things lead to inflation even though the economy is not fixed at all even though these people aren't working making components and nobody new is hired it's just you threw free money into the economy and you caused different problems so you've shifted your problem your problem was the people who got laid off making iphone components couldn't eat that's a problem that has to be fixed but the unintended consequence of feeding those people and giving them housing and shelter and so on and so forth is that you are artificially stimulating the economy they then in turn remain iphone demand remains high you're there using up all the the uh the, the storage base of components and then you run out of iphones now the rich people will pay more for iphones right it costs more money to get an iphone costs more money to get components than the people who do have them eventually you run out of components and even if you want these phones you can't get them that causes even more inflation that causes then people go and buy other phones that they wouldn't that they might not have bought anyway and then you have a distorted demand picture because all of a sudden you can't get an iphone so people start buying android and then android has a great uh christmas season why because you can't get an iphone but you know what happens the pundits will tell you oh my god everybody's rushing into these new android phones they must be so much better than apple no apple just ran out of shit <laughs> you know it's, it's how it works so, uh, you know, when you when you do this stimulus stuff, you really can't keep track of all the things you screw up when you're doing it. And the screw up lasts a long, long time after the stimulus. There are a lot of items, and you probably noticed at the stores and things like that, that you just can't get certain things. Um, it's because there's disruptions in supply chains all over the place. Certain things are just simply unavailable or unavailable at a good price or run out quickly. And I don't mean toilet paper and stuff. I mean like, you know, like like stupid things like certain foods that you like or whatever. I can't, um, there was a, a carnation multi mix my kids like and I like it. So the, and that, that was no, that's off the shelves for whatever reason uh canada dry had a, a green tea ginger ale you can't get anymore certain things just disappear all of a sudden and for whatever reason they, you know and they're usually not mainstream things but they're things that uh for whatever reason the supplies got disrupted carnation couldn't get the cocoa they used to get to make the thing um you know uh and components for tvs the remote control we needed wasn't available you know things just the Suddenly, stuff isn't available. Chips aren't available from certain manufacturers uh, because they shut down for three weeks in, you know, in China or whatever. And all of a sudden, nobody can get this chip. Now, if this chip is a critical component in something you need, you can't get it. And now it's starting to impact the auto dealers. The auto dealers are not going to be able to make millions of cars this year because they're missing chips. And that takes a long time to fix. Supply chains take decades to build up. And they run smoothly, and they usually run smoothly because the supply chain grows with the uh, with the manufacturing. So usually the chip factory will get bigger and make more chips and so on and so forth, and the cars will make more cars roll off the line and so on and so forth. We were talking this morning about lithium. 
uh, lithium is in demand for uh, electric vehicles. And uh, we're going to run, we well, people think we're going to run low on lithium. I don't think lithium is, uh, let's see, let's look at lithium production. Because if you want to invest in lithium, you should sure as hell know what lithium production looks like. Lithium Pro production. So what year is that? There we go. Okay. So global lithium production. So global lithium production was 40, whatever, 40 kilotons um, in 2017. Then it went to uh, whatever. I don't know. Let's make it. I mean, we're, we're at 40, 45, 60, 90, 100, 120. So we're at 100 here. So we have made basically double the amount of lithium in 2020 that we made in 2018. And in 2022, in 2022, we're going to make another 50, 60 percent more. So. Do we have a shortage of lithium or is it ramping up quickly? Maybe lithium isn't in that short supply. Maybe it's a plentiful thing. You know, my impression of lithium is it is, it's, it's, it's like a pain in the ass, but it's not like it's unavailable. I don't think you're going to run out of it. Global lithium production to triple over the next four years. Here's another chart. So that's got nothing to do with it in store power capacity that, that had nothing to do with that um but you get the idea growth of cloud computing blah 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 no 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 lithium lithium is what we care about okay they're probably an article from 2017 18 there you go see so in other words there, there, there is a, uh, you know, when you have growth, you have growth in an industry, you may have short-term supply issues, but that doesn't mean that you have a global shortage. It just means that there's not enough lithium this week for that. But then they open up two more lithium mines and suddenly for two weeks you have too much. This is why commodities go up and down, okay, because demand and supply don't follow the same path all the time. And then whenever there's a mismatch, Price can go one way or the other, but that doesn't mean it's a good long-term investment. You're not guaranteed that that's better. Now, on the other hand, though, if you assume that demand is, is only rising, I mean, supply is only rising to keep up with demand, then it's good for a company like ALB, who we talked about this morning, is a good purchase. And ALB has lithium mines, and they are going to increase their production, and they and they are I like them because they're large in the space. They already have the connections. So they're gonna, they've already got their contracts with Tesla and whoever. And all they're gonna do is feed more into the people they already have. So I think that, um, you know, the, the, as long as the price doesn't drop precipitously, their increase in production should lead to more profits, more sales, more profits growing into the number that they have. They were, they're priced at, something like 30 times earnings. Well, I'm sorry, they priced at 30 times earnings if the earnings improve, I think we decided. So they're, yeah, they're at 18 billion and, and they're 600 million in, um, in profit. Not, not, not last year, but in a normal year, they should make about 600 million. So if you assume that ALB um, goes along this path, they will go up 60%. They'll go from 600 million to 900 million, a billion in profit. At a billion in profit, 18 billion starts to be very good looking. And if they're going to go up that much in a couple of years, of course we want to play them. There's no reason to think they're not going to grow with the industry. So they should grow with the industry. We don't, but we believe demand is sincere, that we have a sincere change over to electric cars. We're going to have demand there. And again, it's going to be forced to some extent. We're not ready to go electric. Um, where the, you know, I, 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 my, my, my mother was talking about this cause she was looking again, she's saying again, the Tesla, but then she's, you know, she's practical and wherever she goes, she thinks about where she'd be parking her Tesla. And she has decided she's not getting a Tesla because she, there's not enough places to plug her car in, you know, including her own, uh, including her own building. So 
she's not bad. She's not totally thrilled with the idea of buying of, of getting a Tesla because she's worried. Where am I going to put it? Where am I going to plug it? How's it going to get charged up? Um, that's not. So you don't want to worry about that. So these things need to be addressed. So if we if we're going to get serious about electric cars. I think the electric car companies have to do something about the infrastructure and either they need to sit down with Exxon and Chevron and whoever has a lot of gas stations and say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. You know, we're gonna we're gonna put charging points here, 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 or they'll just go completely differently and just ignore the big oil companies and uh and just make deals with I would make deals with all the, the mall operators and people like that. I would I would make a deal with Simon Property, who we we have a, a investment in, um, you know, and other large mall operators. And I would say, okay, each of your malls will have um, 500 uh, charging spots for electric cars, and that way, when people go to the mall with their electric cars, they can have a valet, and then you see those valets at the malls all the time now. So for 10 bucks, let's say you can go to the mall, and for 10 bucks, and this is a good business for anybody who wants to start one up, uh, you go to the mall, and for 10 bucks, you give it to a valet who takes it to an electric charging spot. And, and when you're done shopping, you come back, and you have a fully charged car that you pick up. That's nice. And they could do that in towns also. Towns can do that and consolidate their parking into, into large lots with valets. And the valet service would make their money selling the uh, uh, electricity, the net of selling you $5 worth of electricity plus the parking fee of five bucks. And you can do that almost anywhere in America. So you can take turn any town center and any mall into a place where you can get your electric vehicles charged up without bothering gas stations at all. You just, you just pull up to the front of the mall, give a kid your keys, and boom, and you come back later, and it's you got a fully charged car. What's wrong with that? That's not hard to set up. So if we want to get serious about electric car infrastructure, somebody needs to step up and, and deal with the basics first. How do we keep them running? How do we have the charging? How do we make sure people have what, you know can use their car? And keep in mind, you're in, you're in Texas, which, which of course, they're, they're you know, going gung ho, crazy, blaming or anything environmentally friendly on on their problems. But if you're in Texas and you haven't had power for five days, it might occur to you that you can't drive your freaking car if it's electric. You know, now now some people have those electric. I heard I heard on the other hand though, there are people who have those electric Ford trucks, the uh, F one fifty electrics or whatever they are, and they apparently have like a nuclear power plant in the back of the car. Um, uh ford and 150 electric generator so yes yeah, so, so people are actually powering their homes with the cars that's <laughs> kind of cool So, so it does go the other way, where the car, your car, is actually a functioning power plant, um, and that's useful in a blackout. But of course, when you know when your car runs out, you're in trouble. Um, oh, they they say it's for the hybrids also. I guess it's a hybrid gas electric too that can do it. Um, but that's kind of a cool thing. So you know, but you just have to figure out how are you going to charge it, how are you going to make sure these things have power, how are you going to secure the grid, so on and so forth. And that, fortunately, it's a democratic kind of thing to do. That's what Democrats love to do, shit like that. So hopefully they'll get on the ball and start thinking of the basics. Uh, oh, unlike the Ford, using Tesla as a generator to avoid its warranty. That's weird. So the F-150, uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting there. Uh, Freaking ads, go away. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh well. Oh, it's not all electric yet. It's still a hybrid. These things. But that's kind of cool. And 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 
I don't know how long they last. I don't know the power capacities and so on and so forth. But conceptually, it's kind of cool that your 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 car can back up power for your house. I mean, that's that's just nice to know that you have it for an emergency. And um, so things are going to change rapidly, but they're going to and they're going to be forced, and we're going to have disruptions because of the force. Because we're going to force, in other words, if you force electric vehicle demand ahead of the ability to supply lithium, yes, you'll have a lithium shortage for sure. On the other hand, though, if you grant a lot of mining permits for lithium miners and allow more allow allow more to be made or encourage it, or if the uh, uh, if the rumors of needing lithium cause more and more people to start mining lithium, and you have an, and you have the supply, you could, and then the and then the actual demand for the lithium isn't there because people can't. There's not enough actual infrastructure to distribute for the electric cars. You could end up with a complete glut of lithium, and it could take years for the demand to catch up to the supply. So these things go both ways, and you'll see examples of both ways. And it's very confusing when you're reading the news and you see this. You can easily pick articles that say, "Here's a here's a glut, here's a shortage," on the same stuff because that's just in nature. There's a push pull of supply and demand that takes a long time to re reach an equilibrium. And when you distort the markets by art through artificial stimulus and so on, you then cause the supply and demand uh, differentials to to be more and more skewed. And it makes it very hard to invest on both sides. So yeah, you can build a case, same thing with the silver. You can build a case to say, oh yeah, we need more silver, blah, blah, blah. There's a shortage, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, it can swing the other way so quickly that it'll snap your head off. So, you know, it's it's not the kind of thing, it's, if, it's very different than the time that we like, we you know, we were gung-ho bullish on natural gas. And uh, this was a long time ago. Energy, natural gas. Okay, so, you know, back here, in the, in, whenever natural gas was down here at two bucks, we were bullish on natural gas. Why are we bullish on natural gas? Because my logic was that liquefied natural gas makes it, uh, natural gas has always been a local thing. You can't transport it because it's, uh, it's air, basically. So, you know, we don't send clean air to China. It doesn't work. There's not there's enough money in it. It's, it can't be transported. So liquefied natural gas compresses the gas 660 times. So now instead of sending one tanker of, liquid, of natural gas, you're sending 660 tankers worth of natural gas at one time. That's the whole point of LNG. So what does that do? That changes natural gas from a local market to a global market, right? And what it used to be is that the U.S. would pay two bucks for natural gas, but the rest of the world would pay um, four, six, and eight. Asia would pay eight. Uh, uh, the, some parts of the other parts of the world pay six. Europe would pay about four because they got it from Russia and so on and so forth. So basically, it would be it would be either it was two, four, six, eight for natural gas around the world, depending on how close you were to Saudi Arabia, to the producers, and how much pipeline reach there was, and what the transport costs were otherwise. Japan, having absolutely no oil resources at all, was just totally screwed. So they were paying eight bucks. So it was Australia, so were other parts of Asia. China has some oil production, but they basically keep it in-house. Russia's got oil production, theirs all goes to Europe. And so nobody else was getting it. Af Africa's screwed, except for what they get out of the Middle East. Um, so it all depends on where you were. Now, now that you have liquefied natural gas, so instead of having a local market for natural gas, depending on how far away you were from the source, now it's coming in tankers to everybody. And what does that do? That evens out the pricing. So therefore, if we in the U.S. have the lowest natural gas prices at two bucks, what you expect to happen is that we will rise because now we're we're playing into a global market while the rest of the world will come down. That is exactly what happened. But it took years and it spiked us up. We spiked up on, on speculation. We went back down because it wasn't really there. There was a glut of production, uh, the shale and all that crap, right? 
Then we went back up and the LNG terminals came online and uh, more, more got exported for a while, but now we are normalizing a bit and coming back down to our normal prices. But three, four bucks is probably the correct global range for natural gas. So when everybody can supply to everybody who, when everybody can easily supply to anybody who needs it, probably three or four bucks is the right amount. And why is that? Because we have almost an infinite supply of natural gas. So does Russia, so does, so does Saudi Arabia. So once you can move it, it, it doesn't really, you're never going to see these kind of, what you're going to do is you're never going to see these prices again globally. You're not going to have those spikes in demand and things like that. It's probably going to stay in this normal range. Maybe, you know, max will be six, but, you know, three, four is going to be normal. It still makes it attractive when we're down at two still very attractive to get in. It's always going to be too low because someone in China wants that gas. Someone in Japan wants that gas. So there, there's a limit to how low it can go now. And that's great. So as an investable item, whenever we get a chance to buy when it's down here, low in the range, that's great. And we know the top of the range is going to be about four bucks we get out there. But that's different than silver. Silver has its own little... Uh, has its own issues basically. And like I said, silver is way too toppy in the range. It's not as good of an investment right now. Look at gold also. Gold's way up there. So it's not really investable right now. It's not something you want to go long on. I wouldn't short it, but I sure don't want to go long on it. Sure, I certainly wouldn't short gold when Bitcoin's fifty thousand dollars a coin. <laughs> Whatever it is. Fifty thousand dollars for a bunch of, here for this, for this like a group of digits basically. <laughs> That's what you're paying fifty thousand dollars for. Just total, total madness. Anyway, all right. What else? Let's see. Questions. Uh, Bernie's asking about Baba. Am I still positive on Baba? Um, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, long term, sure. But I'm not. I'm not going to jump in and do something with him right. Oh, that's not Baba. And say, wow, they got cheap. <laughs> there we are. So no, but I mean, they pull back, they pull back a little tiny bit. I'm not going to buy into a stock. I'm not going to double down or add to a stock when it went down a tiny bit. We came in around earnings. I think we came in around 260. It's at 250 now. Uh, I figure what our Baba position is. Let's see. Where is it? it must be in the long term portfolio. Baba, there it is. So we're even, right? So our Baba position is the 250-300 bull call spread. We picked it up on the third, and we sold the 200 puts. So where is Alibaba now? So we have the 250. We're at 250, 300 bull call spread for 2023. We sold the 200 puts way down here. And we're just waiting to see what happens. And we did that on the third. So we did it when it was at 265, roughly. And now it's at 250, $15 down. That's not a that's not a time to make an adjustment. If it goes down to 220, I'll be much more interested in making an adjustment. If I get a if we get a serious drop, like a 20% drop, then it's then it then it gets interesting to see if we hold up here and then I'd want to make an adjustment or, or move into a bigger position. But not not now. It's way too soon. We we just took this position and we're even. Think my plus sixteen minus sixteen minus four hundred. There's been no effect. We're in the same position we were when we started. And it's not a small position. I mean, we we've committed to five times two hundred is what a hundred thousand dollars worth of a uh, of Alibaba stock. So no, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to put any more money into that right now. We thought it was going to do well. And we'll see what happens. We certainly, you know, I, it's a quarter to quarter thing. It's like, let's see the next earnings. Let's find out what happens. We 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 bought Baba because we thought Baba would do well because Amazon was doing well. Well, now Amazon's down too. So they're both down, but they have not, it's got nothing to do with their business. This was just a poor man's Amazon play, AMZN. So basically, same thing happened to Amazon. That type of stock has pulled back. We don't think anything is wrong with them in the long term. We we have a strong feeling they recover, but instead of paying three thousand for Amazon, we paid three uh, two fifty for Alibaba. That's all.
Uh, is there any ETF that focuses on high-end hotels and resorts? I don't know. We have to, we'll have to look that up. Uh, what are your thoughts on Barrick Gold going forward? Barrick has come a good deal. Um, we're setting up spreads. Gold. We just did one on Barrick recently. Um, yeah, of course. Wow. Back at 20 for sure. Are you kidding me? Um, why would they not make money? I don't get that. I don't understand. Like, <laughs> I mean, gold has this little pullback. It's so funny to me. Wait, let's look at the uh, dailies. So gold has a little tiny pullback, and people are bailing on Barrick Gold. That is just insane. I I do not understand investors at all. I really don't. Um, so right now they're at thirty five billion dollars, thirty six billion dollars at twenty. Um. They made, and, and I, you know, they had, they had shut down some problems and issues. They made $2.3 billion last year. In a, in a, in a problem year, they're going to make $2.5 billion this year. I'm not sure why that one's so low. But they're going to make $2.5 billion this year. $2.5 billion against a, um, a $36 billion valuation is... Uh, 36 divided by 2.5, 14.4 times earnings. Why would somebody not want that? So again, so in our long-term portfolio, oh, by the way, so the long-term portfolio, since we're looking at it, is um, 1637. And uh, last week, So when did we review it? Last Thursday, we did a review. Tuesday, Monday, Friday, Thursday. Uh, wait, where is it? 1609. So we have the dip, and now the long-term portfolio is at 1637. So the long-term portfolio is up. Twenty-eight thousand dollars. Okay, so let's see. We got the long-term portfolio is twenty-eight thousand dollars. The short-term portfolio. This is where it gets interesting. The short-term portfolio was one fifty-four, and now the short-term portfolio is. Up, oh, back down, 177. Still though, 154, so that's another 23. So plus 23,000. So both portfolios, the long term and the short term, have gained ground this in the last week. Um, they're up $51,000 combined. They were doing better yesterday, but that's because the short term portfolio was rocketing higher while the market dropped. The market stabilized a bit, came back. The volatility is still there, so the short-term positions are still benefiting because of the danger zone that we're in, while the long-term positions have benefited from the recovery that we're having. But so that's but that's basically very well balanced, right? So we made money on a dip yesterday. We were up when the market was down, and now today we're up when the market is up. So we're fine. We're up less, but we're still up. And if you're up every week and you're up no matter what way the market goes, you've done a very good job. And why does that work? Because we sell premium. We're always selling premium. And no matter what happens in the market, premium expires worthless. That's how we make our money. That's being the house. That's the whole concept of the thing. So where was it? So long-term portfolio you're going to look at. Um, so Barrick Gold. So right now, this is a losing position. We have the 23 calls. We have the 27 calls for 2023. So we're targeting 27. We have the $20 puts. We didn't think it was going to go any lower than 20. So right now, everything is a better deal. You can sell the puts for more money than we bought them for, and the spread is cheaper than we bought it for. So this is a fantastic play, although I would go with the 2027 bull call spread now, not the... Um, 
I don't see any reason to change the target of 27. Because like I said, we we're at 14 times earnings. So if we're at 14 times earnings, uh, it's very likely to go higher than that. So I think this is very reasonable that we get to 27. And um, and we can do this spread for probably about the same price as we started in that. And it's very cheap. I mean, right now, this thing's a credit, right? It's 7, 75, 45 is a 8 and 12 and 10, $2,000 credit on this spread. And it's a 30 times 4 spread. It's, an, it's a uh, yeah, $12,000 spread. So the $2,000 credit on a $12,000 spread, and if it all works out, you make $14,000. That's a nice little trade. So that's easy, right? Like, why why would Barrick not make money? What's what's the situation? And if you look at the gold, and then and for gold, you just look at the price of 2019. I'm sorry, 2020. In 2020, gold started off way down here. Half, you know, half the year, here's July, here's June 30th, half the year gold was down here at 16 something. We started this year at 19 and 18. So we're at 18.50 for the first quarter. This is very, you know, when you're betting on commodity companies, it's a very simple concept, right? Last year in the first quarter, they were selling gold for um, for 1,600 bucks. This year, we're in the first quarter, we're averaging 1850 so far. So let's say it's 18. 18 is still more than 16. So why would Barrick be cheaper now than it was last year? It makes no sense. Because investors are idiots. That's what the problem is. Oh, wait. This, if you change this D to a W, you get the bigger picture. <clears throat> so last year, we were just about the same price. This is going to be much better numbers than last year. The comps are going to be much better than last year was. And that 200 bucks, by the way, it's it's not 200 bucks like uh, 20% more profit or something like that. It's 100% more profit because if they were only making 200 bucks in the first place per ounce at 16, now they're making, if it's at 18, they're not making they're not making 20 percent less or 10 percent i'm sorry not making 10 percent more 20 percent more they're making 100 percent more profit that's their profit the money above the price that it costs them to extract and distribute the gold and so on and so forth not to mention we had problems with production last year we had shutdowns we had virus scares we had all sorts of crap going on we had disruption in the marketplace i'm sure the demand is still lower than it was but it's coming back at the higher prices it's, it's insane and again this is why when you got you know you guys talk in the chat room people ask me about like random stocks and i'm like why are you buying a random stock when you can buy barrack for 20 bucks why do we even why are we even having a conversation like that it doesn't make any sense it's like do you there's more than 20 really good stocks to buy they're in the long-term portfolio these are 22 rock solid stocks that we have a incredible, I and mean, I'm not going to do it because every week we end up talking about the same thing. It's the same boring bunch of stocks though, right? Alibaba, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, China Mobile, which is suspended at the moment, Cisco, Foot Locker, Gilead. Now, you notice that there's no weird stocks here. There's no fads. We're not chasing lithium plays. We're not chasing the shortage of this or that. We're not betting on this and that new thing. IBM, IMAX, Intel, 3M, uh, the Plains Pipeline, uh, Pfizer, Tan Tanger Factory Outlet, uh, SunPower, AT&T, Valero, oil refiners, uh, uh, Walgreens Boots the Pharmacy, Wheat and Precious, oh, there's silver, Wheat and Precious Metal, see? We have Wheat and Precious Metal. Um, that's another way, you, that's the way you want to play silver, is use that Wheat and Play. Um, and that one was recent. We just added that. And uh, and Western Union <laughs> could not be a more boring bunch of stocks. Yet we made two hundred and twenty-seven percent in in just over a year so far. With the dullest stocks on the planet. Now, yeah, there were other stocks in here at a time. Uh, we were different. We don't even have Apple. I we wait. That doesn't make any sense. Do we not have Apple. 
No, we don't even have Apple in this thing right now. Because it hasn't been cheap. We didn't buy it. You know I like Apple. It just wasn't cheap enough to buy. It's been a long time since it's been attractive, unfortunately. You know, and not that it's unattractive, but it's just, it's not, it's not on sale. If it's not on sale, why am I going to buy it? You got to find things that are on sale and buy them when they're on sale. And, 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 you know, somebody said that ALB, like we were talking about today. And I said, well, yeah, sure. I think it's great. It's a great long-term play, but it was a, a great long-term play in November at a hundred at 161. I don't, I'm, I don't feel like I got the thing. I don't feel like I came in and found it. I didn't discover anything. Clearly, somebody besides me has already found out that it was a good value and bought it. So I'm coming in way late to the party. So you missed it. Move on. Don't fixate. Don't read an article that says, this is the future. Here's this thing, blah, blah, blah. We have this conversation all the time. Back when we had 3D printers, we had this conversation, okay? We have we have this conversation with, with electric vehicles. We have this conversation with um, um, fuel cell plays, things like that. If you catch it at the right time, great. If you catch it before anyone else catches it and you think it was like ISRG, intuitive surgical. I don't know if there's a chart big enough to show where we were on that one. Um, ISRG. Back before the crash, I was emphatic about this stock. I was like, what on earth could be better than freaking robots? <laughs> where this was, where were we, 2008? Oh, six, oh, seven, okay, I'll be here. So it's been split, so it's hard to tell. But so basically around, around 40 bucks, I was banging the table constantly on ISRG. And when it went down, I was like, just buy more, I don't care. It doesn't matter how low it goes. This is one of my favorite stocks ever. Why? Because it clearly was the future of robotics. It clearly was usable. People were actually, doctors were actually using these things and training on them. And they had a pipeline that they were building of, of, of robots. The first hospital has to buy a robot. Then the doctors have to train on the robot. They have to actually use it and actually work on it and practice with it and so on and so forth. You can't just do it. But then once they got proficient at it, they could speed up their operations like, like I think, 50% more operations per day. And the operations were uh, less invasive uh, because in, because instead of you, put, you know, when they operate on you, they get, the surgeon's got to put his hands in there and operate on it. With the robot, it's just, it, it, it takes these little robot hands and puts the robot hands in there. It does all the same stuff. And the physician is sitting there at a big control panel using his hands to operate the robot hands. And it's all being translated into the robot. And the whole system is great. It's sterile. You don't have to worry about leakage from the physician. You don't have to worry about any gloves breaking or any problems like that. It makes incredibly small incisions. They can get deep inside. You've got infrared cameras. You know how it is with the, well, you don't know how it is, but... <laughs> It's, when the doctor's operating, they got to like shove organs aside to get light in there and so on and so forth and move around things. They can't get in the back of something. This is like freaking robot goes under, over, has its own lighting system, has infrared cameras, blah, blah, blah. It's freaking a hundred times better. And so we talk to people, you know, we talk to doctors at the time. They're like, this is the greatest thing ever. This is going to change medicine. It was pretty freaking obvious. And we played it, and we played it, and we loved it, and we were, and we were in it, and we were in it for quite a long time. Then it went freaking crazy and exploded, and we lost interest. That was the end of it. It's still the future. It's still the, the, the future of robotics and so on and so forth, but now it's trading at 85 times earnings. Not interested anymore. I was very interested when I was trading at 20 times earnings and 30 times earnings even, but when it gets to 80 times earnings, I lose interest. Everybody knows about it. It's already, it's a done trade. It's over. It's crowded. Read more. Don't fixate on something. This is, and I, again, I'm saying this is the greatest thing in the world. I still freaking love this company. Never talk about it anymore because it's gone. It's gone. It's over. Everybody knows about it. It's, it's no, there's no fun to trading this anymore. 
if it crashes for some reason, if something goes wrong, if they have a problem or whatever, and it's like Boeing, you know, like let's say that let's say uh, some of their robots start killing people, <laughs> they go crazy. Um, then we take another look at it. But right now, it's like no. And in fact, I'm like I'm the same way about Boeing. I used to bang the table on Boeing. Boeing Boeing is now gotten completely covered. There's no point. It, it, you know, Boeing was that's that's not Max. You know, Boeing was very interesting when it crashed. And it was very interesting down here these years also back here. We were very interested in Boeing down here. But when, once it gets up and goes crazy, not interested anymore. Earnings, ne look at the earnings, negative 20. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, but, you know, and they, and, they, and they flew up today, as we talked about before the Dow. But... It is what it is, right? I mean, you you got to pick your spots and you've got to buy companies. Macy's, here's another example. Macy's did so well, we cashed him out of the long-term portfolio. It did, did too well. Um, Macy's was trading at five bucks. Here's March of 2020. And it was still trading at five bucks all the way here. Always stem six months of trading, not too much over five bucks. And I was, you guys were bored of it, right? Banging the table on Macy's. Why? Because their land is, Macy's has been around 100 years. There's a freaking movie, Miracle on 34th Street, uh, which was from the 1930s, <laughs> which featured Macy's, right? The Macy's Santa Claus was a uh, really Santa Claus, that one. Um, so Macy's has been around for 100 years. They've been a huge department store. They've been a massive player in the world. They've accumulated an incredible real estate portfolio. And unlike Sears, they didn't get raped by a hedge fund manager. They still got those assets, including an entire block of New York City. And 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 and, and I, I, you know, I, I know it's hard to fathom what a block of New York City is. They're not all the same size, but this is a big one. And a block meaning all the way from one avenue to the next. And then, uh, and then probably two streets worth of um, of size is Macy's in Herald Square. It's a big, it's a big, it's still, the, it is still to this day the biggest single department store in the world. Um, that building alone is worth at least three billion dollars, probably five billion dollars. The market cap of the whole company is four point seven billion dollars. You're getting the business of Macy's for free, along with the asset of the building. Most obvious trade in the world to me. But again, we have kicked it out of the long-term portfolio and lost interest. It already, it already gained enough value where we're no longer interested. It was $2 million. When it was five bucks, this thing was $2 billion freaking dollars to buy Macy's. If I had $2 billion, I would have been very happy to buy Macy's. I would have bought the whole freaking thing. As a stupidly undervalued company. You know, that's when you buy things, when they're cheap. And it seems, I, I feel like it's silly to say it, but I mean, apparently I have to say it because people don't listen. It's like, don't buy things when they're not cheap. Things eat, things always get cheap. Things are cheap. New things come out that are cheap. There's always a way to get something cheaply. Okay, gold right now is cheap. Pfizer is cheap. Is Pfizer. Five years. Pfizer, still cheap. Okay. PE, 19, but that's 19 before they started selling vaccines. Those vaccines, this is, the PE is 19 while they're developing the vaccines in 2020, right? Big push to develop a vaccine in 2020. Lots of R&D, lots of spending, so on and so forth. What are they doing in 2021? They're selling the vaccine they developed. Mostly profit now. All the money comes back. All the money spent in 2020 comes back with a profit in 2021. And this virus with these variants is not going away. So that was easy. AT&T, another one, ridiculously cheap. What the hell is wrong with people? Market cap of AT&T, $209 billion. Here you're not showing any profit right now. They're about to sell off the Dish Network. 
you know, and for a loss, but meanwhile, it'll be good for them to just get rid of it and move on. Um, so what happened? 2020 was a bad year for them. They lost $5 billion. They're selling off the Dish Network. They're going to take a huge write-off. But what do they normally make? They normally make $20 billion. Dish Network doesn't make any money. They're not losing anything by getting rid of it. They're just, lo- they're just getting rid of a, an albatross on their neck. They go back to making $20 billion. The PE is 10 for the frickin' phone company. Pays a 6% dividend. Why would you not buy that? Why would you be doing anything else with your portfolio if you don't have AT&T already? What would be the logic of not buying it? So, you know, it's before you start going out looking for like lithium and things like that and other weird and weird stocks. Do you have the basics that make money? Do you have stocks that are giving you this kind of return? Very simple stocks, very simple option strategies, nothing complicated, nothing crazy. And who's on deck here? Harmony, gold miner on deck. Macy's, there, there's a leftover piece of Macy's that we have, but that's already gone, of course. So back in um, March of last year, we sold 40 of the $8 puts. That was our target price. And see, it doubled our target price. We sold the, the puts. We sold the $8 puts for $4.60. Our net was going to be $3.40. Of course, we want to buy it for $3.40. And here we have the oil services. We decided they were too cheap. That was a very recent play, though. That's an that one we added. So, you know, that's what we need to be looking at. And that's what we need to be doing to build a portfolio. Someone was asking me about building a portfolio from scratch. And I said, look, we got plenty of great plays in this portfolio. This thing's still with fantastic stocks. And not all of them have gotten away from us yet. Some have. You know, Goldman Sachs has gotten away from us. IMAX has completely gotten away from us. A little freaking profit on that thing already. Um, Intel, our stock of the year, has gotten away from us. It's already flying up. Um, 3M got away. PAA is still okay. Pfizer is still okay. Uh, SKT got away from us now, finally. Uh, SunPower got away from us. at and wow, they did well. Um, Valero, mm, it's kind of playable. Um Wheat and precious metals still in play. You know, this, uh, Western Union, honestly, not that they made a couple of thousand bucks, but that's not much considering. You know, this is how we got to play these things. And it's not, and, and for God's sake, it's not like there's nothing out there. There's really, really strong, powerful stocks that we can still play. You don't have to chase things, you don't have to look for the next fad. I know it's fun. And that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with having fun money and putting it into things. But, you know, don't get fixated on it. And like I said, the most important thing, though, is that when you read an article, I was based on that question. When you read an article that says, oh, silver is really good, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Is silver really good? Well, maybe it is. Maybe that was a great play. But you know what? Obviously, you missed it. Obviously, if if it was 14 and now it's 28, you missed it. So I wouldn't touch it. That's the, that's the answer to that one question from God knows when. But that's basically how I look at it. There are better things to do with your money. That's the, the key to it. Oh, let's see. JC says, Barrick is not replacing gold reserves as fast as previously. No, you know why? Because Barrick doesn't buy gold when it's expensive. Barrick is Barrick is running a gold fund for you. Okay, Barrick, what they do is when when gold is cheap, they borrow money and they buy it, and everybody thinks they're crazy when they buy it. They don't buy gold, gold. They buy another. They buy a miner. They don't buy the gold physically. They'll buy a they'll buy another miner and take their property. And then what they do is they take they buy a miner, they take all of their gold properties. Then they pick their best mines that they feel that they can get the lowest cost of production out of. They keep those, and then they sell off the rest. 
That's what Barak does all the time. <laughs> oh, by the way, my friend has a mine that is in um, uh, Dominican Republic that is next to, uh, it's on It's on the same mountain. It's the other half of the same mountain that Barak is, that Barak is drilling in, um, in Dominican Republic. It's going to be a huge gold reserve, one of the biggest in the, uh, in the uh, northern hemisphere, and um, they're uh, raising cash on that one. It's actually a really good deal. Um, so uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> he says regarding gold pricing, there's a worry that Bitcoin and other alternatives will compete. Well, that's nice. I do agree to that. I think that one of the reasons gold is down is because people are putting their money into Bitcoin, as if that's like just as valid. Uh, I don't really think it is though, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, that's, it's again, you, you know, it's, it's, it's great. So let's speculate. Bitcoin is another one that clearly has gone away from you. I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not on board with the Bitcoin thing at all. I mean, fine. It goes up and it goes up and it goes up. I think it's a little stupid. I, and I already wrote a couple of weeks ago. I said, look, there's no reason this thing can't go to a hundred thousand dollars. There's only 21 million Bitcoins. Most of them are being held by somebody. So if you want a million Bitcoins for uh, $50 billion, if you want to spend $50 billion to buy a million Bitcoins, which would be 5% of all the Bitcoins out there, you will have to pay a lot more than $50 billion because there just are not a, bill, there's not a million Bitcoins available. You're lucky to be able to buy a thousand here, a thousand there. I had some jackass who wanted to buy... Um, uh, he wanted to buy $100 million worth of Bitcoin, and he asked me if I could find him anybody who would give it to him for 8% discount if he had cash. And, and, I'm, and, that, and by the way, that works if you're buying silver, if you're buying oil, if you're buying something. If you're buying large quantities of, of commodities and you have cash, you can get people who have futures contracts to convert to cash at a discount. You can get a, a, a long-term, you can get a discount of cash purchase. But Bitcoin is not a commodity. It's a different concept. And you can't just buy it and get a discount. So this guy's like telling me, why you can't find anybody to do this? I'm like, no, you can't find anybody to do that. Nobody's giving you their Bitcoin for an 8% discount. Now, of course, it then drops 16% the next day. So I'm like, oh, there, go buy it. He's like, no, I still want an 8% discount. I'm like, well, that's idiotic. I said, it's now 16% lower than when you asked me. Why don't you just go buy it? I mean, people are just ridiculous the way they play things. And meanwhile, it went 16% down and then popped right back up. So that would have been the best play for him. Um, Steve says, I have a new member question. How do you decide when to do the combination of a short put and a bull call spread versus a covered strangle versus diagonal poor man's covered call? Uh, I see three types of trades, but I don't understand how you decide when and where of each type. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, best thing to do is ask me in chat when we're actually doing one, because this is very what if, maybe this, maybe that kind of conversation. But um, and the bottom line is whichever one works best. I mean, I, I look at all ways to play, and I decide which one I feel has the highest probability of success, uh, a combination of the highest probability of success, the least uh, cash intensive, the best or the, or the best use of my money, as far as it goes, if there's a dividend, I take that into account and how we're going to put it together uh, for targeting purposes. And also sometimes I see the way to play it is I want to uh, generate an income. So I, I will set up a play that allows me to in the future, even if, it, even if we don't do it initially, in the future, I'm looking forward to selling short calls against the position. And you won't see too many of those right now because in the long-term portfolio, we did not sell many short calls. Why? Because we got burned over and over again on our short calls. So we gave up on them for the most part. Although in the butterfly portfolio, we're doing very well with it, but you know, it's it's just a different thing. Well, not very well. In the butterfly portfolio, since we're supposed to be selling short calls, we have sold a lot of short calls, but the butterfly portfolio return is, that doesn't seem right. Are we really up 300% of the butterfly? Oh, well, I guess it works both ways in. I take that back. <laughs> Either way works. But the point is, in the butterfly portfolio, we tend, we, we're basically setting every position up with an eye of selling short calls. Like here we sold the Apple April 120s. Uh, we got uh, $18. Oh, wait. No, we got $6 for them. 
back on the uh, January 15th, and now they're down to 425. So we're at 5,000 bucks. You know, if we make $5,000 a quarter on this position, and we only spent only um, we spent 480, 440 minus that is 120. We have a net credit on this position. And, and then we're taking in 5,000 a quarter. So it's free, we're generating an income, and it's going to, if it goes well, it's gonna pay us a fortune. This is, by the way, like the third or fourth uh, role of Apple that we have though, because we just keep, we, in, in the case of Apple, we're so sure of the value that when we make money, we just put more money in. So we end up, we end up with this position where we have 160, uh, bull call spreads, and it's the 120, 150 bull call spread. We're at 120, and we're very confident in two years we're going to be at 150. This is really the profit from an older trade that we've rolled up and pushed forward. And we sold the short. Oh, I'm sorry. We sold the short April puts. We sold the short out oh, there's puts that we sold. We sold these April 125 calls back on 121, I'm sorry, those are the ones we sold, 15 bucks, and we're, up, I'm sorry, we're up $86,000 on those, I apologize, it's the wrong one. So so on the short calls, we're up $86,000. By the way, those were initially be a problem because they went way against us, and uh, now they finally came back. And I, I, I think I said that at the time, I did. Let's go to the, let's go to the, back to the portfolio. Um, You know, sometimes it takes me more than a couple of days to be right, but sometimes it's right on there. Oh, no, no, it was Friday. Uh -huh. A good example of a... Okay, yeah, in fact, that's what I said. I, oh, we made no changes in the butterfly portfolio. I said about Apple on Friday, because on Friday, well, we, we were still up a little bit, but I said, no changes necessary. We cashed out our old position. The new one is up 150000 in a month. Um, we're very lucky to get a good price for the short April calls that we had to roll. And I said, but then again, that's our strategy. We only have to be lucky once in a rolling sequence. So in other words, we had started off where we had only we had 80 of these, and we had sold maybe 40 of the 120 call of the of of some calls. Whenever whenever that all started, because so we had 80 of these from further back, we doubled down and rolled this position to 160 to accommodate the double roll to move these to move these up to the April 125. So we didn't want to spend more money. We took a bigger position. I said we only have to be lucky one time. So in other words, what happened to us during this position is Apple, oops, there it is. So Apple was going up and up and up and we rolled and rolled and rolled. And it was at 140 and we were getting our asses handed to us. We took the 120, 150 spread to cover ourselves in case it kept going up. But the bottom line is it we only have to be lucky once. And what happened is boom, fell right off the table. And so this is us being lucky. So now we have now made all that money on that position. And in fact, um, as of, um, what, wait, what's this number here? 298, yeah. So as of, as of uh, Friday, we were $57,000 up on that, on that particular short call. Now we're $86,000 up. So we, we gained $30,000 since Friday, just on those short calls on the pullback and how much has the bull call spread uh changed it was 90 uh what, 94 minus 7 is 87 77 so this was seventy seven thousand dollars and on friday it was um wait what it was, yeah the profit was seventy seven thousand dollars and on Friday, the profit was 80, 91. So this went down 14 and this went up 30. 
And that's what I mean. See, that's where that's where we make money in either direction on the market. So in other words, part of the trade went down, part of the trade went up, but we sold so much premium that we benefit from the from the loss of the premium more so than it hurt our bull call spread. Not only that though, but fundamentally we firmly believe that bull call spread will be fine over time. So there's nothing to panic about. But meanwhile, these guys are panicking because they are losing all their money. They have a very tight time frame. They've only got uh, 56 days left for this for Apple to pay off. And Apple has to be at 125 plus 15 for these guys to break even. Has to be at 140 for them to break even. I expected Apple would come down. And this then generates for us tremendous profit. And we only have to hit that one time. And we get to roll and roll and roll. And eventually, if we're right, we pick up the entire, in this case, $150,000 in a portfolio that was only $100,000 to start a year ago. You know, that's, I mean, that's how you make these phenomenal returns. I mean, you just, you, but what are we doing though? We're not doing anything exciting. We're not taking any great chances. Okay. I understand it can be scary when you do things like this, but what are we doing we're selling a shitload of premium that's what we're doing we're being the house we're running a game the game we run is selling premium and when people play the game against us when they say i'm going to take that position and they buy premium to bet against us they will lose that premium every time no matter which direction the stock actually goes they're going to lose the premium they put down on the table and that's our house advantage. The money they give us up front is the premium. The premium that they give us up front is, is going to be zero. And all we have to do is also be lucky on our side of the table sometimes. But since we have the buffer of collecting the constant premium, we don't have to be that lucky. We don't even have to win half the time. Statistically, we're going to win half the time. We're either going to be right or we're going to be wrong. If we're right half the time, and we stay kind of even on the actual bet, on the underlying position bet, then what's going to happen? We make money on the spread. That's, in, in fact, the whole concept of sports booking, sports betting in Las Vegas is based on that, right? The whole goal of the bookie is to pick the number that half the people are going to bet one side, half the people bet the other side. It comes out basically even for them. They're giving half the people's money to the other half of the people, but they're keeping the spread. They keep the they keep that middle part, and that middle part is all the profit, and that's what we do. We keep the middle. We keep that middle premium every time. It's guaranteed money for us. Sometimes we can be very unlucky. Sometimes the bet can go so wildly to the wrong direction that we lose money. That does happen. But fortunately, this system generates so much capital that you have to be pretty damned unlucky to lose money doing it. All right. Let's see. Oh, I got to wind this thing down. Um, do, 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 do. JC says, your thoughts on MJ at these levels? Good for a new entry. Uh, where is MJ now? I don't think so. I think it kind of got away, didn't it? But on the other hand, though, I think, oh, oh, wow, nice pullback. No, actually, all right, yeah, I would play it. Um, one thing I like about the MJ ETF is it has phenomenal uh, premiums. So uh, how are we doing all these things? Huh. Nothing exciting there. Okay, so the MJ ETF has really huge premiums. So it's a very big swinger. Um, these are, but these are not American companies. That's the problem. So it's uh, you know there's a lot of uh, legal movement. <laughs> There's a lot of movement to, to legalize in America, but these guys are mostly Canadian companies that don't really benefit from it. Um, the, uh, they, they probably will diversify and have some money into the States and some people are gonna be in there and the ETF may add, who knows, but there's not a lot of really public money in America, but this American thing is rolling now. Every day you read another uh, state is coming online, is doing something, is passing another thing, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be, you know, by the time we're done with the Biden administration, it's going to be pretty much legal most of the country. And um, and that's going to be just 
incredible money for this industry. It's going to be major growth. Uh, I don't know how well placed the Canadian companies are going to be for it. And again, it goes back to it's like you got to know what you're investing in the ETF wise. And, and by the way, we did put money into the MJ ETF. We we're doing very well, but we're not, you know, we're you know we're not expecting it to go through the moon or anything like that. Um, but again, you go to holdings in this case when you're looking up there. And these are Afria, Tilray, Canopy, GW, Kronos, Aurora, Grow. See, most of them are still the Canadians. So uh, the, the, you have to research more and find out the footprint and who's going to be in America and who's going to really benefit from this. And, and there's not, you know, again, it's early, it's early innings right now. And there's not, you can't by nature be a public company because it's still federally illegal. You know, once that changes, everything will change. But it's still federally illegal. So, you know, the, the, there's nothing to there's nothing to make money on in the market based on what's happening in the U.S. and the and the demand in Canada isn't enough to to support any kind of exciting growth in that in, in this space. And you can't take pop that you make in Canada and sell it in the U.S. So, you know, basically, we we loved MJ when it was really cheap, but um. And really cheap being like down here, we were loving it, but now it's more than doubled and it's the same thing. It's just, it's not that interesting anymore. And there's not enough, um, there's not enough Ford catalyst to say that this is the way to go. Steve says, I have a new member question. How do you just, oh no, we did that already. Um, oh, I see. I went backwards because I skipped that at some point. Uh, is there a good trade now on AAPI or wait? I asked me that in chat. I got to look that up because I haven't looked at them at all because I couldn't possibly answer that off, off the cuff or anything. All right, guys. So I have to go because I didn't have a lot of time today and I've already taken up more time than I thought. Um, everything seems fine though. I mean, look, every, the things are plowing ahead. Everything looks good. Market looks strong. Uh, we did not get a negative reaction to what Powell said at all. I mean, a little bit at first, but then everybody recovered quickly um everything is awesome basically i mean everything's looking strong and good and whatever i do like running oil up here but again it's very tricky and you've got to take your profits when you get these little dips otherwise you get screwed um rb when it hits two dollars is a no-brainer if it even gets it if it makes it there it's pretty far though uh natural gas is getting cheap that might be interesting to play long but not yet <clears throat> and other than that we're good so you know, a couple of good trade ideas, but we have to, on the whole, just watch out what we're doing. Uh, these markets are so stretched, though, and so dangerous. I just want you guys to be really careful. Look at this. 32,000. Right there. Just almost right there, 32,000. Going to be 4,000 S&P. It's only, only up there a little bit. NASDAQ. Well, we're already, we're already at crazy numbers on the NASDAQ, so that's okay. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, and again, again, my premise, my premise this week, and I've been talking about it, is saying, look, you know, we're only getting here through the stimulus crap, and we're racking up the debt, and everybody's expecting us to pass the stimulus bill, and it's supposedly going through. It's going to be one point nine trillion dollars, um, but after they pass that, then what? And that's what remains to be seen. It's, it's, they're going to pass it, but a lot of times these are selling on the news kind of things. They're going to pass the stimulus, and then what's next? Then we need our next fix. It's like being a heroin addict, right? It's not enough. It's never enough. It's never going to be enough. Um, they'll have to. They'll have to find out immediately. They'll start asking, "What? What's the next thing we're going to do? What are we doing after that? What? How are we going to improve the economy now?" And and if you have a habit that requires $4 trillion a year to be pumped into the economy just to keep it going. Something bad's gonna happen eventually. But meanwhile, this is why we have our strategy. This is why we hedge and we have our longs in the long-term portfolio. We have been buying stocks. We're not shy about getting more stuff, but we also have a lot of hedges just in case. And as you can see this week, the hedges absolutely pay off for it. So it's worth doing. Okay, it's, it's, you know, yes, of course, obviously we lose. In fact, the short-term portfolio was down, uh, I don't know, it's down about 30% or something like that recently. 
Um, and now it came back and now it's about flat. So great. But, you know, that's our insurance policy. It's, it's you're going to lose money in it when the market does really well and you're giving up a chunk of your long-term portfolio earnings, but it's worth it to protect. I wouldn't be playing the long-term portfolio this aggressively if I didn't have those hedges. And that, and that's the thing. I mean, to me, in my mind, I, I would not, could not in good conscience be playing any of these longs in this market if I didn't know that I can protect myself on a downturn. So it's not a waste of money. It's the thing that enables me to make my long money is my short money. That short, those short bets allow me to make my long bets. If it wasn't for them, I couldn't sit there and just have a naked long portfolio. I could think that would be madness. You know, there's always a would have, could have, should have. But it's, 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 it's like riding a car with no brakes, right? It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, okay, I want to drive a car. And I want to go, I do want to go forward. And, you, and someone said, well, it's got no brakes. And you're like, well, what? that's okay. I'm only going, I'm, all, I'm going straight there. I don't want to stop. <laughs> but what if you need to stop? Oh, well, you know, hey, <laughs> we'll just wing it. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are. It's a very artificial market. It's being boosted by stimulus. And it'll work until it doesn't, just like in 2007, 2008, it worked until it didn't. Then all of a sudden it collapsed and everybody went, oh, what happened? And, and the signs are there. The bond market is in complete chaos. The sure sign of stress somewhere. And, and the Fed can keep pumping money in and pumping money in. And you can keep pretending none of that matters, but eventually it's going to matter. And just, you know, just be nimble. That's all. Look at this. Ugh, wow, that's fun, right? GameStop, back to 50 bucks. And people are buying it. People are buying it like crazy right now. There's all kinds of people like, oh my God, we can get in again at $50. It was five. Five is the correct number for the stock. 50 is still too much, but it was 500. So people think 50 is a bargain. Ah, crazy. Investors are crazy. Anyway, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Have a lovely, lovely week. And we'll do it again next week. Oh, wait. How do you turn this off? I forgot. All right. Take care, everybody.